You can't think how glad I am to see you again, you dear, old thing, said the Duchess, as she tucked her arm affectionately into Alice's, and they walked off together. Alice was very glad to find her in such a pleasant temper, and thought to herself that perhaps it was only the pepper that had made her so savage when they met in the kitchen. When I'm a duchess, she said to herself not in a very hopeful tone though, I won't have any pepper in my kitchen at all. Soup does very well without maybe. It's always pepper that makes people whore-tempered. She went on, very much pleased at having found out a new kind of rule. And vinegar that makes them sour and chamomile that makes them bitter and and barley sugar and such things that make children sweet-tempered. One, only wish people know that. Then they wouldn't be so stingy about it, you know. She had quite forgotten the Duchess by this time and was a little started when she heard her voice close to her car. You're thinking about something, my dear, and that make you forget to talk. I can't tell you now what the moral of that it, but I shall remember it in a bit. Perhaps it then one. Alice ventured to remark. Tut, tut, siled. One ud, said Duchess. Everything got a moral. And she squeezed herself closer to Alice's side. As she spoke, Alice did not much like her keeping so close to her fist, because Duchess as very ugly and secondly because he was exactly the right height to rest her chin on Alice's shoulder and it was an uncomfortably sharp chin. However, she did not like to be rude, so she bore it. For that, well is at as she could. The game's going on redder better now she said by way of keeping up the conversion tittle. This no, said the Duchess. Send the moral of that is oh. This makes the world go round. Somebody said, Alice whispered, what it's done by everybody, minding their own business. Ah, well it's mean much the same things, said the Duchess, dinging her sharp little chin into Alice's shoulder as she added. And the moral of that is, take care of the sense and the sounds will take care of themselves. How fond she is of finding morals in things, Alice thought to herself. I dare say you're wondering why I don't put my arm round your waist. Said the Duchess after a pause. The reason is that I'm doubtful about of the temper of your flamingo. Shall I try the experiment? He might bite. Alice courteously replied, not feeling at all l anxious to have the experiment tried. Very true, said the Duchess. Flamingo. And the moral of that is birds of a feather flock together. Only mustard isn't a bird, Alice remarked. Right, as usual, said the Duchess. What a clear way you have of putting things. It's a mineral, I think, said Alice. Of course it is, said the Duchess, who seemed ready to agree to everything that Alice said. There's a large mustard mine near here, and the moral of that is, the more there is of mine, the less there is of yours. Now, exclaimed Alice, who had not attended to this last remark, it's a vegetable. It doesn't look like one, but it is. I quite agree with you, said the Duchess, and the moral of that is. Be what you would seem to be, or, if you'd like it put more simply, never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have. I think I should understand that better, Alice said very politely, if I had it written down, but I can't quite follow it as you say it. That's nothing to what I could say if I chose, the Duchess replied, in a pleased tone. Pray don't trouble yourself to say it any longer than that, said Alice. Oh, don't talk about trouble, said the Duchess. I make you a present of everything I've said as yet. A cheap sort of present, thought Alice. I'm glad they don't give birthday presents like that. But she did not venture to say it out loud. Thinking again, the Duchess asked, with another dig of her sharp little chin, I've a right to think, said Alice sharply, for she was beginning to feel a little worried. Just about as much right, said the ducks as pigs have to fly, and the M. But here, to Alice's great surprise, the Duchess voice died away, even in the middle of her favorite word moral and the arm that was 
linked into hers began to tremble. Alice looked up, and there stood, the queen in front of them, with her arm folded, frowning like a thunderstorm. A fine day, your majesty, the duchess began in a I.O. weak voice. Now I give you fair warning, shouted the queen, stamping on the ground as she spoke. Either you or your head must be off, and that, in about half no time, take your choice. The duchess took her choice, and was gone. Let's go on with the game, the queen said to Alice, and Alice was too much frightened to say a word, but slowly followed her back to the Krogquet ground. The other guests had taken advantage of the queen's absence, and were resting in the shade. However, the moment they saw her, they hurried back to the game, the queen merely remarking that a moment's delay would cost them their lives. All the time they were playing the queen never left off quarreling with the other players and shouting off with his head or off with her head. Those whom she sentenced were taken into custody by the soldiers who of course had to leave off being arches to do this so that by the end of half an hour or so there were no arches left and all the players except the king, the queen, and Alice were in custody and under sentence of execution. Then the queen left off, quite out of breath, and said to Alice, Have you seen the mock turtle yet? Oh, said Alice, I don't even know what a mock turtle is. It's the thing mock turtle soup is made from, said the queen. I never saw one or heard of one, said Alice. Come on, then, said the queen, and he shall tell you his history. As they walked off together, Alice heard the king say in a low voice, to the company generally, you are all pardoned, come that good thing, she said to herself, for she had felt it quite unhappy at the number of executions the queen had ordered. They very soon came upon a griffin, lying fast asleep in the sun, up, lazy thing, said the queen, and take this young lady to say the mock turtles and to hear his history. I must go back and see after some executions I have ordered. And she walked off, leaving Alice alone with the griffin. Alice did not quite like the look of the crecature, but on the whole she thought it would be quite as safe to stay, go after that savage queen. So she waited. The griffin sat up and rubbed its eyes. Then it watched the queen till she was out of sight. Then it chuckled. What fun, said the griffin, half to itself half to Alice. What is the fun? said Alice. Why, she, said the griffin, tt's all her fancy that. They never executes nobody, you know. Come on, everybody says come on. Here, thought Alice, as she went slowly. After it, I never was so ordered about before in all my life. Never. They had not gone far before they saw the mock turtle in the distance, sitting sad and lonely on a little ledge of rock. And as they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing as if his heart would break. She pitied him deeply. What is his sorrow? She asked the griffin, and the griffin answered, very nearly in the same words as before. It's all his fancy that he hasn't got no sorrow, you know. Come on. So they went up to the mock turtle, who looked at them with large eyes full of tears, but said nothing. This here young lady, said the griffin, she wants for to know. Your history, she do. Lel tell it her, said the mock turtle in a deep, hollow tone. Sit down, both of you, and don't speak a word till I've finished. So they sat down, and nobody spoke for some minutes. Alice thought to herself, self, I don't see how he can ever inish, if he doesn't begin, but she waited patiently. Once, said the mock turtle at last, with a deep sigh, I was Ariel, turtle. These words were followed by a very long silence, broken only by an occasional exclamation of jeeker from the griffin, and the constant hikavi sobbing of the mock turtle. Alice was very nearly getting up and saying, thank you, sir, for your interesting story, but she could not help thinking there must be, must be more to come. So she sat still and said nothing. When we were little, the mock turtle last more calmly, though still sobbing a little now and then, we went to school in the sea. The master was an old, old turtle we used to call him tortoise. Bye, you call him tortoise. If he wasn't one, Alice asked, 
We called him Tortoise because he taught us, said the Mock Turtle angrily. Really you are very dull. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking such a simple question, added the Griffin. And then they both sat silent and looked at poor Alice, who felt ready to sink into the earth. At last the Griffin said to the Mock Turtle, Drive on, old fellow, about it. And he went on in these words, Yes, we went to Shawl and he see, though you mayn't believe it, I never said I didn't, interrupted Alice. You did, said the Mock Turtle. Hold your tongue, added the Griffin, before Alec could speak. Again, the Mock Turtle went on. We had the best of vacations, in fact. We went to school every day. I've been to a day school too, said Alice. You needn't be so proud as all that. With extras, asked the Mock Turtle Alit anxiously. Yes, said Alice. We learned French and music. And washing, said the Mock Turtle. Certainly not, said Alice indignantly. Ah, then yours wasn't a reply good school. Turtle in a tone of great relief. Now at Earth they had at the end of the bill, French, music, and washing extra. You couldn't have wanted it much, said Alice, living at the bot. Tom of the sea, I couldn't afford to learn it, said the mock turtle with a sigh. I only took the regular course. What was that? inquired Alice. Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with, the mock turtle, applied, and then the different branches of arithmetic ambition, distraction, euglification, and derision. I never heard of euglification, Alice ventured to say. What is it? The griffin lified up both its paws in surprise. Never heard of, uglifying, it exclaimed. You know what to beautify is, I suppose? Yes, said Alice. Doubtfully, it mechans to make anything prettier. Well then, the griffin went on, if you don, uglify is, you are a simpleton. Alice, encouraged to ask any more questions about it, so, she turned to the mock turtle and said, what else had you to learn? Well, there was mystery, the mock turtle replied, counting off, on his flappers, mystery, ancient and modern, with, seography, then drawing the drawing master was an old conjurial that used to come once a week. He taught us drawing, stretching, and fainting in coils double quotes. It was that like, said Alice. Well, I can't show it to you myself, the mock turtle said. I'm too stiff. And the griffin never learnt it. Hadn't time, said the griffin. I went to the classical master, though he was an old crab, he was. I never went to him. The Mock Turtle said with a sigh, he taught. Laughing and grief, they used to say. So he did, so he did, said the Griffin, sighing in his ton. And both creatures hid their faces in their paws. And how many hours a day did you do lessons? Said Alice, in a hurry to change the subject. Ten hours the first day, said the Mock Turtle. Nine the next, and so on. What a curious plan, exclaimed Alice. That's the reason they're called lessons, the griffin remarked, because they lessen from day to day. This was quite a new idea to Alice, and she thought it over a little before she made her next remark. Then the eleventh day must have been a holiday? Of course it was, said the mock turtle. And how did you manage on the twelfth? Alice went on eagerly. That's enough about lessons, the griffin interrupted in a very decided tone. Tell her something about the games now. Thanks for watching.